All right, we're going to continue in our series through the book of Philippians, looking at a fixer-upper of God, bringing a fixer-upper into our own lives of renovating our hearts to change us so we can live more like Jesus. And so I want to start with a story. When I was growing up as a kid, I, I think I had an unhealthy obsession with sports. Like I used to play my own leagues that I created by myself in the front yard, okay? And I loved basketball. But I, during the summers, especially right now, I loved watching baseball. And the guy on the screen was one of my favorite players, not my all-time favorite player. That's Ken Griffey Jr., the Seattle Mariners, of course, right? Uh, but this is Frank Thomas, otherwise known as the Big Hurt. And here's why. That man is six foot five and 275 pounds. If you know your football, that's a defensive lineman right there. <laughs> that is a defensive lineman, all right? That is a huge human being. So he's aptly nicknamed the Big Hurt. And so Frank Thomas, he played first base. He was a designated hitter. He's actually a Hall of Famer. Like he's one of the greatest players of all time. But at the end of his eighth season in, in 1999, he hit rock bottom for his career. He had lost the edge on, with his game. He had been, the last two years, had been, as he would describe it, mediocre at best. The writers in Chicago where he was playing were hounding him. They were starting to say, to ask questions like, is he done? Is it over for Frank? Is his career finished? And so Thomas knew he had to do something. So he actually called his former hitting instructor, a man by the name of Walt Hriniak. And, the, and so he was hired on to help Frank. And quickly, when he watched tape of Frank's swing, he saw, okay, something, there's a couple mechanical things we could work on here, here and here. That'll, that'll fix some problems. But there was a bigger issue that Frank was dealing with. He had lost his focus. You see, Frank was trying out different ventures outside of baseball. He tried to start a sports marketing firm called Big Hurt Enterprises, and that had actually gone totally belly up. He also tried to start his own record label, record label called Undeniable, and that was also draining his personal finances. And so the question and the decision he had to come to was whether or not he was going to continue in all these different ventures or was he going to set those aside and focus completely on baseball. And so that's what he did. He set those other things aside. He put all the other distractions aside and he focused completely on baseball. And so as Christians, we struggle with a similar focus problem. We get ourselves so focused on the cares of this world, like our jobs, our kids, our finances, our schedules, that we lose sight of who we are as followers of Christ and what we are called to do. Like Frank Thomas, we need to take some time to remember who it is that we are and what it is that we need to do for, to live for Christ here and now. And because Paul is going to say something that's going to surprise many of us in here, He's going to say, those who have put their faith in Christ alone and are made right with him are citizens of heaven. Not will be someday when we die, but currently, right now, our citizenship is in heaven. If there was such a thing as a spiritual passport, our primary citizenship would be listed as being in heaven with Christ and not here on earth. But our focus problem is we have a tendency to live for the here and now, not considering how we ought to be living as if we currently live with Christ in eternity right now. We need a shift in our focus. And so this morning, we're going to look at the three habits of a citizen of heaven, and that's following the patterns of Christ and others, to view our citizenship in heaven as a present reality, and stand firm in the cause of the gospel with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So I invite you to go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be starting in verse 17. If you need a Bible, grab the one, grab a Bible in the seat in front of you, page 1180 in those Bibles. And while we turn there, let me give a quick background of the book and where we have been so far. Paul's focus throughout the book has been about joy. Joy and gratitude towards the Philippians for providing financial gift for him to be able to continue in ministry, but also in their participation with him in sharing the gospel with other people who don't know Jesus, and also a joy in living for Christ. But he has also appealed to the Philippians to have unity amongst one another and to stop fighting with each other and to follow the example of Christ, who in humility counted others more important than himself. 
And so we're going to see how Paul references back to that idea this morning. And so we're kind of jumping ahead. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to get to it later, verses 1 through 16 of chapter 3. We'll get to that in the next couple of weeks. So let me give you, because we got to understand where he's been to where he's going to go this morning. So here's a little summary of verses 1 through 16 of chapter 3. So much of the early church was dealing with false teachers coming through who were confusing the gospel that Paul had preached to these new Christians, these new believers who had no reference point in the faith of Judaism. And so they were coming in, they were twisting it, they were starting to say, oh, well, you got to follow the rules. You got to get circumcised. You got to eat certain, you can't eat certain foods. Like there, all these rules, these were the things that would help you be truly right with God. And so Paul makes an argument here that if righteousness could have been obtained simply by obeying the law, then he would be the perfect candidate because he was the cream of the crop of Jews. He was the best of the best is what he says in the beginning of chapter 3. But then he had to learn that it is only by believing in Christ's perfect sacrifice on his behalf that he could be made righteous before God. And it was not on any of his own ability to make that happen. And so for Paul, the best pursuit of any Christian is to truly know Christ deeply and personally. But this, happened, this happens only by identifying our old selves as being dead with Christ, crucified with Christ. And that we now have a new life in him when we put our faith in him. And so because there, has, they, there was persecution and difficulty that the Philippians were going through, he encourages them to press on, to continue forward toward the goal of Christ, the call of Christ towards heaven. And so this is for all of us to pursue as well. So let's go ahead. We're going to read verses 17 through 19. It is on the screen for us, um, but let's, let's read this. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have, have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So Paul implores the Philippians to join together, to come as a singular unit in following his example. And this is a phrase of what we would say discipleship. And this is something we need to understand. Discipleship is far more than just a program that a church has. It's as the Philippians would have understood these words that Paul is using. It's imitating a teacher, a leader over you by putting into practice what they are teaching you. And so for us as Christians, our ultimate leader is Christ. He is the one that is our ultimate example. And actually the word Christian literally means in Greek follower of Christ. It's not just a religious box that you check on a census, but it's a choice to imitate Christ with the way that you live. We must put into practice what Christ has taught us to show evidence that we are truly a follower of Christ. These things that we do, these works that we do, don't save us, but they are an evidence that we have been saved, that we have been changed from the inside out. And so for Paul, this was his life goal, and he wanted others to imitate him as well. He says this in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. In other words, copy me as I copy Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so they, because they have, the Philippians have him and his ministry buddies that he has brought along on many of his journeys as models of how to follow Christ, he says to keep your eyes on those who live as we do. He's basically saying, look, be looking around for other people, be on the lookout for others who do the same, who walk in a similar manner, who live in a similar manner, meaning their behavior, living uprightly in, in all that they do. And so what way are they walking? Well, they're following the patterns of Christ, setting aside the old life and allowing Christ's way of life to become their way of life. It's to change the way that we live our life because Jesus has changed us from the inside out, not by any moral willpower of our own to grit our teeth and make ourselves do it, but because Christ has transformed our hearts. And so now Paul's going to give, in verse 18 he's gonna, and 19, he's going to give a contrast of people's example that they ought not to follow, to stay away from. And so these ones he will describe will have a walk, a life and model of behavior that is opposite to the way of Jesus. And so it's hard to figure out exactly who Paul is talking about here when he's thinking about it, but based on his language, it's likely people who are outside of the church at Philippi already. They are not a part of the, of the church. 
And he doesn't address their teaching, but he's addressing that the way that they live. And it says that he has, he thinks about them with tears, or he's told, talked about these people with tears. And likely what this means is a couple different things. Either he is talking about people who profess that they are followers of Christ, but whose manner of living does not reflect it whatsoever, or that they have once claimed that they were followers of Christ, to believe in Christ, but now have decided to walk away from it. And so Paul grieves over these people. He weeps over them. But he says, but now they are enemies of the cross of Christ. He's using very intense language. But for Paul and for Christians as well, the cross is the center of God's means of redemption. But it's also the foolishness of the world. They look at the cross and they say, that, that's all you have to do to be saved is to believe in Jesus? That's it? And they think it's foolishness. Paul actually says that in 1 Corinthians 1.18. It, it is the foolishness of the world. They think it's crazy. And so when these enemies of the cross of, the Christ, of cross of Christ walk according to the pattern of the world and not of the cross in Jesus, they are enemies of this cross because they are denying that the power, that the cross has power to save for those who believe. And you've got to understand, Paul has great compassion for these people. This is not a statement of him taking the place and being angry about them and talking about them as the scum of the earth. He's just saying, this is who they are, and I weep over this fact. We need to weep as well over people who have walked away from the faith or who are not living a life that reflects Jesus and claiming to believe in Jesus. And so this is what he says. Their destiny is destruction. What he's talking about is the ending result of their lives. They're going to be forever separated from Christ. They're going to be destroyed Oh, and on the other hand, those who believe in Christ, our destiny is transformation, as Paul will see, as we'll see Paul discuss in verse 21. We'll get there in a little bit. But so these people may have appeared to be followers of Christ at one point, but now they are no longer. And so how do we identify a person like this? Well, Paul gives us a few little identification markers. First of all, their God is their stomach. What he's talking about here is that the concept is of an excessive craving to fulfill their appetites and bodily desires. Basically, that they pursue any pleasure that they want, anytime they want, wherever they want, whenever they want. They're just literally pursuing it at any point. And so as that is, and it has become their God. And then he says their glory is in their shame. So they are glorying in these things. They're delighting in these things. They're reveling in it. They're excited about it. They love it. And their consciences have been so seared that they can't see that they're glorying in things that God hates and that Christ has died for on the cross. So really what he's doing here, it's, it's kind of an ironic turn of phrase because really what they should be, that what their mentality should be is they should be ashamed at what they're doing, but instead they're glorying in it. They're reveling in it. Look at what I'm doing. Isn't this great? Glorying in their shame. And then lastly, he says, their mind is set on earthly things. They don't simply think about earthly things a lot. It occupies their mind, but their minds are set on it. Their focus is on it. And it comes in contrast to what Paul has been talking about himself in chapter three as being set on on Christ. They have abandoned the pursuit of the heavenly prize of Christ to pursue the present things in this world, to pursue their own desires. And so we have to always take inventory and see, man, am I doing this? Am I doing this right now in the way that I live? Am I modeling myself after the world rather than modeling myself after Christ? We have to always be considering that. Am I living in this way where I, my, God, my God is my stomach, where I pursue my own desires of what I want to do rather than pursuing Christ? And so as Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them if they are not walking according to the pattern of Jesus, but according to the pattern of the world. And so this is our first habit that citizens of heaven follow, is that we follow the patterns of Christ in others rather than the patterns of the world. So as I said before, discipleship, go ahead, Jack, go to the next slide, bud. There we go. All right. As I said before, discipleship is more than a program or even more than a Bible study or a book study with some friends. It is a life on life, followers of Christ, loving each other and challenging each other to live more and more radically for Jesus in their daily lives. Because our focus can be so connected to the cares of this world, whether it's homework, bills, kids, our kids' sports and activity schedule, keeping up with friends, our home repair, social media, the news, all of 
these things can completely occupy our time, but instead we need to be intentional about our focus being solely on Jesus and looking about how we can pattern our life after him. And so this is the question we need to ask. How is it that Jesus wants us to pattern our lives after him? What do we need to do? Because discipleship is all about learning to pattern your life after Jesus, our ultimate teacher, but also by seeing how others who we see doing the same thing, patterning their life after Jesus, that we would say, I want to I want to follow that person as I see them following Christ. If you want to walk closer with Christ, an easier way to do it is to follow along follow somebody else that is you can see is really following Jesus. The Christian life is truly about discipleship, about following Jesus. It's not about feeling better about yourself. It's not about getting your dreams to come true, to get what you want from God. It says Jesus characterized it. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, I like to say this from time to time, but Jesus, probably, if he had a PR guy following him around, would probably have advised, hey, don't say that whole deny yourself, take up your cross thing. You're not going to get many followers that way. But Jesus was speaking the truth. The way to live is to deny yourself. Not to have your God as your stomach, but to deny yourself. Take up your cross, this shameful execution thing, and follow me. Deep, it's intense stuff. So how do we pattern our lives after Jesus rather than the patterns of the world? That's the question, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves today. Let's go ahead, we're gonna continue to read verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And so he's connecting this verse back to what he has just stated about watching those who model Christ and also being able to identify those who don't do that. And so the Philippians maybe have relaxed their view to the future uh, reality as who they are as followers of Christ. And so Paul needed to remind them again, and this is what he says, our citizenship is in heaven. Notice he doesn't say will be, but is This is the ultimate reason for following Paul's example as he follows Christ, because he's recognizing his true citizenship is with Christ. That's where he truly belongs. And I want to take a a quick moment, a quick sidebar to clarify, I think, a misunderstanding here that a lot of people have about what heaven is. Heaven is not merely the place where Christians go when they die. That's not totally incorrect, but I would call it more incomplete. It's not the full picture of what happens. So the guys over at the Bible Project, I I think I plug them pretty much every time I'm up here. They put it beautifully. Heaven is God's space where he dwells, where the realities of his kingdom are ever present. And earth is our space, but it was supposed to be God's space. It was created, the two were created to be one and the same. But because sin entered the picture, it split them. But however, the whole story of the Bible, the story of redemption is to bring God's space and our space, earth, back together into one place again. So it's actually better to kind of talk about heaven, not merely as a place to go to when we die, even though that is pretty much true, but think about it as dwelling in the presence of our perfect, loving creator for all of eternity which is what we were made to do. This is what we were created for. And that's the opportunity that is given to us. And so Paul is actually making a very interesting connection here to this idea that we talk about in uh, church circles and theological circles called the now and the not yet. This is what it means. The kingdom of God has, has come now through the person and work of Jesus, and it is a true reality for our everyday lives. However, it's not fully completed yet because we are still waiting on Jesus to return. And when he returns, he's going to bring it to full completion. So we live in this tension that the kingdom of God is here now, but it's also still to come. We're still waiting for it to be fully brought to bear. And so this not yet is so certain that we live in the now as if the not yet is already here. I hope you followed me on that. 
In other words, we live like citizens of God's kingdom while we are still living in this world waiting for Jesus to come back. We live as individual pockets or outposts of God's kingdom within this broken world that we live in. And we pursue living well for Jesus, living upright and holy lives set apart from the rest of the world because we are citizens of heaven. And as Paul has pointed out several times to the Philippians and as the Philippians have experienced it, this will lead to persecution because remember, the cross is foolishness to the world. So they're going to look at the things we do, the way that we live, and they're going to think it's ridiculous. They're going to think it's silly, but it is the truth. And so then Paul's, Paul says, and we eagerly await a savior from there, Jesus Christ. Our great hope is that this life is not all that there is, that Christ will return someday to take us to our true home with him in the future. And so this is why, as Paul says earlier in chapter 3, that our focus, that we must focus on the call of God towards heaven in Christ. Think of it like this, and Paul does the same thing. Think of it like finishing a race. The return of Christ or our deaths are, is the finish line. And so we run, pursuing this finish line with all of our might, pursuing Christ up until we reach that finish line, that Christ return or we die. We pursue those things all the way up as hard as we possibly can. And Jesus will return from heaven. Notice how it says it, will transform our bodies. These things are going to happen. And Jesus, this is actually what the disciples were told when Jesus ascended into heaven, they were told by two angels, they said, he is going to return in the same way. So we are eagerly awaiting for that return to happen. But Paul does something, I think, astoundingly beautiful here. The word he uses for savior, he only uses one other time to refer to Jesus. One other time. And however, but the Philippians would have recognized this term because it was a common title for Caesar. They called him savior. And Philippi was known as Little Rome because of its great loyalty to Rome, the Roman Empire. But the term is also frequently used in the Old Testament to talk about God, my savior. So what Paul is doing here, by using this term to refer to Jesus, the Philippians would not have missed this. First of all, he's talking about this is God, that he, Jesus is God in the flesh. This is the God of the Old Testament that we have talked about. He is God incarnate, but he is also a greater and better Caesar. And the beauty of it is he connects this to the future, in the future to why the Philippians must rejoice in the Lord because he is their savior who has redeemed them from their sins and made them citizens of heaven while they eagerly await for his, for his return to end their suffering. And in the meantime, as he says here, they are being conformed to the image of Jesus. This is verse 21. Verse 21 focuses on how Jesus functions as savior in the future to come. Yes, our sins are forgiven. We are made right with God and we are enabled to live for him in this life by his spirit dwelling within us. But there is a future hope that is absolutely incredible. And Paul's focus is on the future bodily resurrection of those who are followers of Christ. And so let's ask this question. What is the power that enables him to bring everything under his control? This power he is speaking of is usually only one that comes from God the Father. In Psalm 8, 7, it says that God will subject all things to his Messiah. And that what's going to happen is that Messiah then is going to give it back to God. So it's actually, this is Christ's own power himself as God to subject all things under his control since he is the ruler of it all. And so remember, the Philippians were under severe persecution. Christians were under very severe persecution at this time for their belief in Christ. And so the powers that are subjecting them, the powers that are persecuting them will eventually be fully subject to Jesus. And I think that's a beautiful hope for us right now in our kind of tumultuous world, especially politically, that any powers that we can think of around the world that are not of God and are subjecting people in awful ways that someday they will, they will subject themselves to Jesus for what they have done. And so this should create an astounding hope, not just for the Philippians, but for us. Because here's what Christ is going to do with this power. It says he will transform our bodies. Like that's a promise. This is what's going to happen. He will transform us so that we will be like Christ. And Paul uses two words here that I think are awesome. For transform, he uses metaschematizo. It's fun to say Greek words. I'm not going to lie. 
I, got to, I learned how to do that this year. And then he uses, for like, this likeness idea, he uses sumorphon, which also could be translated conform. These two words actually connect back to Philippians 2, 6 through 8, where Jesus took on the form of human likeness, even though he is God. And now the, he's talking about basically the reverse. Those who are now mere humans will be transformed and conformed to the image of Jesus. We will have, look at this, so that they will be like his glorious body. It doesn't mean that we will become gods ourselves. That is a huge mistake in understanding this. We will be like God. We will have these resurrected bodies, these transformed bodies that I actually think, based on this testimony of scripture, are gonna be the kind of bodies we were created to have at the very beginning before sin entered the picture. I think that's gonna be awesome. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more sicknesses, no more diseases. None of it. It's going to be beautiful. And it'll be kind of like that body that Christ had when he resurrected. So he got to eat. He walked around. He might have still slept. I think I'll be honest. I think heaven would be kind of lacking if we uh, couldn't eat. I think we'll get to eat. And some real good food up there. So the ironic turn of phrase here is that the enemies of the cross glory in their shame, but that shame is going to lead them to their destruction. But this is the flip side, the beautiful thing of this. But even as those enemies of the cross of Christ seek our destruction, our shameful position in their eyes for believing in something so foolish as the cross will eventually lead to our own glory and being transformed into those resurrection bodies. It is an incredible truth. And so this is what we need to do, our second habit. We need to view our citizenship in heaven as a present reality rather than a future destination. Again, the mistake by many Christians is to believe that heaven is simply a future destination rather than the fact that we are now present outposts of God's kingdom because we have been radically transformed by God's Holy Spirit living within us. And so we need to have our focus reset on this and how we live as citizens of heaven in this present reality rather than viewing our workplaces as the place where we get the paycheck so we can pay the mortgage, the bills, the utilities, have food, we need to view those places as our mission field to share the hope of Jesus with people who don't know him. Rather than viewing your neighborhood as simply the place where you sleep, the place where you live, view it as God's divine placement to put you there. You are that outpost in that neighborhood to share the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus to your neighbors. And for those of you who go to school, don't view it as a necessary evil or an obligation. View it as the place to shine the light of Jesus where there is the darkness of depression, the truth of Jesus where there is confusion, the love of Jesus where there is hatred, and the hope of Jesus where there is hurt. You have an incredible hope that you can offer to so many people no matter where you find yourself. All of this is about bringing the kingdom of God to bear on this world that so desperately needs it. And that is what we are called to do as citizens of heaven who are simply awaiting Jesus to return to make that citizenship a completed and full reality. Let's continue, verse one in chapter four. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I lo love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Suntuke to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. So whenever we see that word, therefore, always ask that question, what's the therefore, therefore? And what he's doing is he's connecting back to something that was just, what, he, what he's just been talking about, what we've been talking about already, about imitating Christ, about living as citizens of heaven. Therefore, because of these things, he's now going to apply all of that to what he's going to say next, to specific situations in their, in their church. First of all, he's going to make it broad about the entire Philippian community, Philippian church community. And so if he's come across strongly to this point, what he's going to do now is he's going to remind them how much he loves them. Sometimes you need that, right? When somebody comes down on you, you need them to remind, <laughs> you, need them to remind you that they still love you, right? And this is what Paul is doing. 
And he says he finds them to be his joy and his crown. What he means by his, his joy, he finds great fulfillment in what God has accomplished in them. And that his crown is the, is the prize of Christ, to see others grow in Christ. That's his crown. That's his great reward, is to see them grow and to become followers of Christ. And so he urges them, because of these things, to stand firm in the Lord. He's referring all the way back to everything he has talked about through all of chapter three, about the importance of imitating him as he imitates Christ in order to attain the prize of the citizenship of heaven and be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. So you stand firm in this truth. You hold on to it tightly and you walk in it. You live in it. But now he's gonna pull out a specific application about two women who were disagreeing. Now, how would you like to be forever enshrined in a document like this that you couldn't get along with somebody? I think I'd be pretty embarrassed if I saw my name and went, oh, that went everywhere, did it? Awesome. But I actually think Paul has been building to this point. Part of the reason he wrote this letter is to get to this moment to talk about these two. And you have to think about it, especially when you look at how he has talked about unity, humility, valuing others above yourself. All of this applies here. And we don't know. We have no idea what their disagreement actually was about. But we can tell by the way that Paul describes them as contending at his side in the gospel that it was likely not a belief thing, a theological thing. They had the gospel. They understood it. They were followers of Christ but that they were likely disagreeing and arguing and fighting over a very practical how to do it, how to live the gospel kind of thing where we can have freedom to disagree, but they were, leading, they were letting it lead them to be disunified and it was hurting the church. And what's interesting is that Paul hardly ever mentions anyone by name in this way, hardly ever, but I think he names them because they are his friends and he wants them to get along and to work together because they are leaders in this church and to have leaders disjointed like this, fighting like this with one another hurts the unity of the church. It is not what we want to see. So instead of fighting, they need to have the same mindset in the Lord, the same focus of pursuing the cause of the gospel. It's about the mission of Christ to make disciples of all nations who can make disciples. And so then Paul asked this person, my true companion. If you've been reading the book of Philippians with us the whole way, he has yet to ever reference this person. And all of a sudden he just drops that, just pulls it out. A long discussion could be had about who this is, but I'll give you my opinion. I think this is Luke who he's talking about, the guy who wrote the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And that he is there in Philippi and that he can then try and help these two women come alongside each other to settle their differences, maybe still continue to disagree about something, but to recognize that they are both sisters in Christ, followers of Christ, and need to stand together because their fate is truly sealed. They are true followers of Christ. Their names are in the book of life. They are destined for eternity with Jesus in heaven, but they need to learn to stand firm together for the cause of Christ. So this is our third habit is that we must stand firm in the cause of the gospel together rather than separately. We are better as followers of Christ when we are together. We need everyone who calls this church their home, serving to the best of their ability with the gifts that God has given them. Because that cause is not simply to build a bigger church, but to bring the gospel to our community, our neighborhoods, our city, our state, our country, and our whole world. This is not a cause that we can accomplish simply on our own, individual efforts. We need to cast aside this mentality as well that there are professional ministers, but that we are all called to be ministers of the gospel wherever we go. But we can only do this if we do this together. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is why you don't see the early missionaries in the church go by themselves places. They took others with them because they could stand strong together. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. A huge part of the outflow of Jesus saving us is to bring us into a brand new community of believers. And so the more we are united together and working together towards the same goal, the more that we can accomplish. So if there are petty differences, that we might have with other people in our church, we need to set them completely aside and be united and pursue the mission of Jesus together to save the world from their sins. I purposefully didn't tell you the end of the story of Frank Thomas until now, 
to tell you this is what happens when you change your focus. When you focus on one singular thing rather than all extraneous things, when you focus on following Christ and let that filter through everything else, you can have more, you can have more success and fruit in your life of living for Christ, having more peace. You can be more successful in sharing the gospel. But most of all, you would be living on mission for Jesus, which is great. So in the year 2000, after Frank made his decision to focus solely on baseball, he had a much better season. For statistical comparison, in 1999, he hit 305, which actually, a lot of guys would love to hit 305. You know, he's getting a hit three out of 10 times. Like, that's great. That was a down year for him. That tells you how good he was. But he only had 15 home runs and 77 RBIs in 135 games. For him, that's a down year. So the next year, when he reoriented his focus, fixed his swing, he hit an elite level, Hall of Fame level, 328, getting, basically getting a hit 33% of the time. That's insane. Okay. With 43 home runs and 143 RBIs in, a, in 159 games. So almost close to averaging, scoring, helping the team score a run once a game. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame and someone like me is not, <laughs> okay? So what we need to do is we need to renew our focus to be solely on Jesus rather than the concerns of this world. And so we need to remember all these, to follow the patterns of Christ and others, to view our citizenship in heaven as a present reality and to stand firm in the cause of the gospel with our brothers and sisters in Christ so that when we come to Christ, when we believe in him, our, our focus must shift to living as a citizen of heaven right now rather than waiting until the very end. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, this morning. God, you are so good. We love you. Jesus, you are such a gracious God and compassionate God and that God, this beautiful reality that our hope is set completely on you and the fact that we are now citizens right now as we sit here on earth waiting for you to return. So Jesus, help us to imitate you and that Jesus, we could also look at other people who we could imitate as they follow you. And Jesus, we want to recognize our citizenship is totally in heaven. And as well, Jesus, help us to stand firm together for this cause of the gospel so that, God, we can truly live as citizens of heaven here and now. We pray this in your name. Amen.